Another you, episode of Bram Radio. Today we have uh, Dr. Greg Wark here, the author of uh, Warfighter's Soul, um, Engaging in the Battle for the Warrior's Soul. This is so uh, um, everybody who knows me well knows I'm not a huge reader. <laughs> yeah, but that's why they made um, uh, audio books and and or or books with lots of pictures in it. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's that's what I require. Um, but when I read this book, um, it 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 did something to me because I I I have a lot of friends from you know my former life in the military that aren't here anymore, and they're not here. Um, m- many of them, especially recently, because they have taken their own life and that is the um, that that's it's it's incredibly tough to deal with yeah on 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 our end the people who are still here who who saw somebody uh, a day before and then the next day they're not here and you're looking at well what were the reasons i i didn't even know that there was a struggle there and uh this book gets into that and it begins to really explain and kind of knock down some of the stuff that we have that we're running around with that that uh, are issues that are from either back in childhood or maybe in combat that bring us to a place where we see no way out. And uh, this book, uh, this book knocks it down. I also notice that there's a that there's a uh, a chapter in here called Bram. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I can write a book without Bram. Uh, Every time you write a book, stories. you rat me out on something. I rat you. I, it's my only way. You always, you always beat me on the verbal front, so I, I'm the, going to beat you on the written front. <laughs> you sure do. Um, but uh, uh, just for the people watching, uh, so they don't, uh, they're wondering how. Uh, you know, just for one, for credibility's sake, because so they know that you do know what you're talking about when it comes down to this stuff. But our relationship also is not just one that just started um, a year ago, or five years ago, or ten years ago, or twenty years ago. Um, man, 1996 is yeah. when I met you. Yeah, in a gym. In a gym, of all places, and uh, it was it was the it was the funniest thing when. When uh, when Pastor Greg and I met, so I was really into lifting and trying to get as strong as I could. And uh, I don't know, Zach, have you ever heard this story? Yeah, this is this is this is a this is a crazy one. So in my introduction <laughs> to you, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell the, be- the the beginnings of of how we met, right? Because it's actually my testimony anyway of how I became a a, a believer in Jesus. And I was I was working out and doing crazy workout stuff. And was, yeah, you're standing on a one of those balls with two forty fives, yeah, it was a big, huge exercise balls. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, well, who does this? Who is this guy? <laughs> I walk in, I'm like, you know, I'm in pretty good shape, you know, at the time. All right, I'm like, just there's no way I couldn't notice that this was um, <laughs> this was violating the physics. Yeah, it wasn't normal behavior, and that was before everybody was actually using. Yeah, core stabilization exercises. Yeah. This is in the mid '90s, and and uh, um, you walk up to me and say, "Hey, uh, can I talk to you about something really quick?" And I was like, "Make it snappy. I got I got stuff to do." Okay, well, God wants to use you. Um, uh, he wants to use you in communicating the Word of God. He wants to use you in. In uh, you, you're you're going to be in the film industry. You're going and you kind of went down this road of specifics that I was pretty. I was pretty confident you had lost your mind. Absolutely, yes. And uh, you were looking at me that way. You were yeah. communicating that by word, gesture, and spirit completely. Right. Yeah. And and I said, "See, Zach, now you know where I get it." Right. The word, gesture, and spirit. Yeah. That's not the first time you've heard that. <laughs> and 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 I remember. I remember being quite dismissive and then getting back to my workout. Well, Clark gave you my number. Well, no, no, don't pass on this because... Come on now. Because I, I got done saying all this stuff, 
and you looked at me. Now I didn't know what you were, who you were, or what anything. <laughs> and you you looked at me with this this like this dismissive eyes and said, uh, "Do you mind if I go back to my workout now?" <laughs> That's what you said. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I'm like, uh, "Okay," you know, walked away, and that was that. I could see it. I could see it. It it may have it it, it probably happened that way. Yeah. And I um, I remember getting a getting a, a and it was you know, a week two three weeks later whatever and you just started calling and checking on me and I didn't quite know what to do I remember one time you called we were having a party I lived in a house I remember that yeah with a bunch of team guys and we were having a party that night and there was this uh, there was this girl there that I was I was uh, I was I was eyeing and uh, she. Uh, the phone rang. I answered the phone. It was the time where they actually had a phone attached to a wall. To a wall, yeah, and, and with a with a with a with a cord, spirally cord on yeah. it. And I, I answered the phone, and and she walks she walks by, and uh, you're like, "Hey, Bram, it's Pastor Greg. Come and check on you. See how you're doing." And I said, uh, um, "Hey, good to hear from you." She walked by, and well, here it's for you. I hand her the phone. I walk off straight to the kegerator. Get a big thing of beer <laughs> and forget about it. A fire and forget moment. I walk by her about 45 minutes later. She's sitting on the floor underneath the phone. Did I ever tell you this part of it? Yes, you did. And she's sitting on the floor, like right underneath the phone base unit, which is on the wall. And she says, uh, and she she gets up and she she uh, she hands me the phone and uh, or she or she hangs up the phone. She turns around, looks at me, and says, "It was nice meeting you. I'm going to go now." Yeah. And I said, "Well, what what happened?" She goes, "I just had an encounter with God." And I was like, "That was Greg." Yeah, I was. I love the fact I screwed up your situation. Yes, you de- absolutely did. I'm yeah. glad you did too. I've done that for a lot of guys. Yeah. <laughs> And so, <laughs> so it, it and I was in that one of those points in my life where my life was just spiraling, out, spiraling out of control. Yeah, I mean, on the outside, it looked like I had it together, but it, it, there was there was there was just a couple issues in there. And uh, I remember one night, it well, one day, it came to a head where I just I was just like I don't know what to do, and your your name popped into my into my head and uh i went and found your number and i called you and i said okay we need we need to meet and and uh, you had something like oh how about you know tomorrow at no no, no i i remember i said uh let me look at my calendar and your response is no no now yeah right the <laughs> heck now yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure I use those words. Yeah, yeah. Shit, right the heck now, <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm, and I remember saying, yeah, right uh, now, got it, uh, in route. So, um, so we were in the parking lot in front of Starbucks in Mission Valley, just off Friars Road. I remember the late. In fact, not long ago, you and I were in a car. We, we were, yeah. Yep, and I, I took you. I said, I didn't know that, and I didn't, I didn't remember yep, it. Pulled into that same exact parking spot, and uh, and as soon as we got in there, I began to just pray and be grateful to God for all the things that have happened to me over the years, that um, and for the hand that you've played in it, because you've been such a um, a coach and a mentor and a dad to me. Um, that means a lot, yeah. and it's it's uh, and being a, a being a member of your family, and not just an arbitrary member, like an actual member of your family. There was a season in my life where I actually lived with yeah. you, yeah. and it was. Uh, I mean, it's it's just all these things. I remember some of the stuff that you would say to me. I remember when I was when I was much younger and always always doing just my shady young team guy stuff. You would you would sometimes call me and say, "Hey, would you?" Uh, would you like to meet me at the beach? Let's go for a walk on the beach. <laughs> and that was that was code for you in trouble, boy. <laughs> You'd go out there in your nice, calm, kind way. Let me know what a turd I was being, and I better shift course, or things are only going to get worse. And uh, sometimes I would listen. Many times I wouldn't. And you were absolutely right. Um, things yeah. would get worse. And so, it's, I used to say to you. 
Well, I guess you won't do that again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you, when, when I told you, but I guess you won't do that. Yeah, again. yeah. You, you, you never, you never did that. I told you so thing. You never did that. You always, but you always did say, I guess you won't do that again. And I remember once I called you. I said, "Is that your? Is that the nice way of saying I told you so?" You, I guess you could put it. Yeah, you could put yeah. it that way. One of these, and then you said, "One of these days, you're going to figure out that 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 uh, when I when I am." pushing you towards a certain direction it's it's probably the direction you should go so the one thing i learned from that is you 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 have to be careful who the authorities are that are in your life 100 um, percent. and it's very important that every man has that authority that that guy who, who who's gonna love them like a son and this is regardless of age right <laughs> going to love them like a son is going to uh, steer them. And the words that you always use is the, is the G's. You're going to guide them. You're going to guard them and you're going to govern them. And, and since then I have, I have taken on this thing where I, at, at any given time, I try to have five dads and they're always vetted over time and, and time spent in the cockpit with them. Right. Yeah. Flying over the, the landscapes of life, and the more time you have with somebody, you start figuring out like the, the, what, what this guy is, is is putting down. I definitely want to be picking up, and so since then, it's you know Sandy Wheeler. Um, yeah, got in. It got uh, got into that. I have um, I have uh, my my business me- mentor, you know, uh, Bill, and my my dad, not my biological dad, but the one that adopted me. Yeah. Um, and since I, I was a baby, because you know, I was an orphan, and just these men who have always, they, they've been dads longer than me. They've been fathers and husbands and business guys, speakers, ministry, all the things that I've done in my life, they've done that longer than me. And also are grounded in the word of God, know what they're, know who they are, and most importantly, know whose they are. Yeah. And that is, and that was one of the, the first principles that I learned from you. And I, I, I took it on board and uh, I, I couldn't be more grateful for you and for God for putting you in my life. And uh, I am stoked to have you here for the next few episodes. We're going to cover, cover a bunch of stuff and, uh, and talk about some of the things that are happening around you now as a result of uh, the warfighter soul uh, of which I have five copies in my office that uh, I, I give to people that I know would benefit from this. But, uh, you know, I, I wanted to say something, Bram, um, you know, I was, um, I, I didn't live a very good youth. I was, my mother was dead when I was uh, 12. I was pretty much, my father was a factory worker, tool and die maker had very little interaction with him but when when I when I got saved there was something that something that kind of clicked in me uh, basically I knew nothing about the Christian faith I knew nothing about fathering I knew nothing about discipleship uh, but the first thing God did for me is he brought me into a relationship with a great man dr. Edwin Lewis Cole mm-hmm and Dr. Cole became my father, and he became my spiritual father. I know that that term's thrown around a lot in Christian circles and stuff, but I want to say this to the guys that are watching, is that don't avoid the whole concept of having a father in your life, someone that sees through you. If you, you, know, if you, if you want to be successful in any venture, which every man should want to be successful— if you the fa- having fathers in your life is absolutely essential, people that can hold you accountable, mm-hmm. and a lot of today we live in a society that is fatherless in every in every way. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are hiding uh, and and uh, afraid to have someone look into their soul. And let me say this to you: if you if you, if I ever were to to define what a father is, it's the individual that can look into your soul without judgment. And without a uh, personal agenda, and decide to be part of helping you move forward. Mm. I'm 68 years old, and I still have those people in my life. Mm. Uh, but there's nothing. First of all, you can never become a father if you have not been 
father. So if you resist that concept, it's you're just hurting yourself. So, so, so to put that in context, like so, when you say you you can't, it, it's impossible to become a father unless you've been fathered. Doesn't you're not you're not you're not attaching that just to biology. No, it isn't. But I'm not talking right. about biology Correct. at all. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. I'm talking about. You know, uh, my son Daniel is my youngest of uh, four sons. Daniel, I love Daniel. Yeah, he's he's amazing. Oh, that he's boy. so successful. But the other day, I called him and I said, "Daniel, I said, who's your business?" You know, he will forever in my mind. He will forever be nine, eleven years I old. I know it. But forever. now he's like six two. He's buff. He's got this beautiful wife and three kids. Yeah, and he's a sex, successful businessman. But I called him just last week and I said, uh, "Daniel, I said, uh, who's your business uh, mentor?" And he basically told me it's a it's a team guy actually it's a hmm. team guy that's a very successful businessman. And he said to me, he said, "Well, because uh, he brought it up before," and I said, "Well, why aren't you? you know, why isn't he in your life?" Well, he said, "Man, he's he's expensive." I said, "Really?" I said, "He's expensive. As much money as you make, he's expensive." I said, "That's not the reason." Hmm. I said, "You just don't want someone to push you beyond." what you want. And I said, I'm going to hold you accountable for that. You know, I'm your biological father and also a spiritual father, but I said, you need to have these people in your life. And I, I think it's a, it's a subject that, that, um, is not, it's, it's one you and I've talked at nauseam, about, oh, yeah. but it's, it's, I didn't want to leave this moment without that opportunity to say that, you know, and, and as far as finding fathers, if you know, if you, are open to a father, you'll find him. Yeah. He'll find you. Something will happen. Right. That's what. That's the way it works. Yeah. For me, I think it was, you know, uh, I wasn't smart enough to know that I had to be introduced. It had to go. It had to be, um, it, it had to be almost a, I'm, I guess the word now that we would use is organic, you know, but it was absolutely God intervening into my life and dropping you right in front of me and the joke we always make about you i don't know if we do it to your face really but i say we me and i don't know how many other team guys that you have sat in conversations much like this one or just where their their uh, life is a big ball of mess right in front of them and you're 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 separating out with yeah them. that's what it and is there's been I don't know, like tons of them, but it's the the ones that I'm close to that we we talk about. You it's just like man, you could take that guy and drop him in the Middle East, and you know probably the problems would be solved. You know because you always know exactly what to say, and if you don't, you're just saying you, you'll say. And I've used this so often. It's like I don't have your answer, but I'm going to I'm gonna I'm gonna. I'm going to go and I'm going to think about this and then I'm going to come back with it. And I've used that so often, just even in business meetings, you know, just don't know your answer right now, but I will. And I'm going to go and find out. And it's just, it's uh, the relationship that I have with God now is such a real one. That's not based on, it's not based on, on, on training on, theology and the, the, the yes. it's, it's religion, not, I guess, like the religion, yeah, religious, religiousness or legalism, right? You know, um, uh, you know, Jesus was a man's man and, and he did man stuff. He worked with his hands. He liked to hang out with his friends. He, and he was always, he was, he was always on and he, he never had a moment where he wasn't on and he wanted, if he saw a need, he would meet it. And those are the examples that I see right now of all the, the stuff that's happening. And people are like, uh, you can look at in politics right now and you can see people that say, Oh, isn't it atrocious? The homelessness. Oh, isn't it just so bad? Like, like this is happening over. It's, but it, it's, as long as, as long as it doesn't come into my yard, I'm going to look at it. I'm just like, man, that's terrible. Hey, somebody should do something about that. Somebody going to do something about this? What? Do something about it. Be, be, a, be a do something dude. Get in there and, and fix stuff. Well, we don't have that anymore. We don't have men being men standing up saying enough is enough. No, um, you crazy, weird dynamic that's trying to infiltrate my family, my kids, uh-uh, you got to get through me first, and good luck with that, because I happen to be a handful, and 
I have a foundation in the word of God. You're not getting through to my family. And it's being the gatekeeper. You, you don't have men being gate gatekeepers anymore. And that's the stuff that I learned from you because I remember some of the knuckleheaded stuff I was doing as a, as a, as a young military guy, you would always say, Hey, how would you, how would you feel if, if your kids had to struggle with the same thing? I said, man, that would be terrible. I said, okay. So, you know, it can stop with you. Yeah. And, and this doesn't have to become a generational thing. So what's it, what's it going to be? But for you to stop, it means that you have to stop it. So you're going to have to take authority. I mean, I just remember that conversation. And again, it was on a beach walking. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, 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 it, the way that I look at this whole issue of um, men being r- men, I think we have a, a, a massive departure from manhood because of self-disqualification. So men live in such guilt over things that they disqualify themselves from being a part of the answer in society's mm-hmm. issues. So you have men running around in sitting with sitting places and doing stuff, and the minute it come, the minute the Lord touches them to make a difference in any capacity, they remember all the other stuff that's going on. Yep. And and it's it's something that men need to understand today, especially because self disqualification is is not uh, in the Bible. We're not given the right to disqualify ourselves. The Bible doesn't say that. It says get forgiveness and then keep your your tail moving forward. And that is the, this whole guilt thing. It's it's the jihad against faith. It's that basically, if I can make them feel guilty, I can take their manhood. Hmm. And look, I, I, know, I know a lot of us have, we have issues in our life that need to be dealt with. That doesn't disqualify you. And, uh, you know, yesterday I buried a, a Marine friend, a very good 40-year friend. And one of the things I ended it with is that we all have a is mission. This one? Yeah, uh, yeah, my co-author, Ray Rodriguez. Yeah, Ray Rodriguez, the guy that wrote this book. Yeah, I buried him yesterday. And wow. one of the things that, that he said, that he his I asked his wife, she texted me and said, the only thing I keep hearing him say is, carry on the mission. And I'm dead, but you carry on the mission. And I, I said, that's what we all should take from here. Carry on the mission. Do what you need to do. You don't have to be perfect to be a father to others, to make a difference in society. And one of the things that God put in me a long time ago is that you can come up with answers without being perfect. You can make a difference. That whole book is written not because of scholastic achievement, even though I have many doctor, uh, many uh, 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 degrees. That's not where I learned this stuff. I learned this stuff walking with guys like you, Mm. looking at the issues that they're facing. I remember at the very beginning when I began to work with you and your community and the special op community, I looked at them and I thought, I have a a great family, a great marriage. I'm, you know, I have all these things. Why can't they have the same thing? And I felt like the Lord came back to me and said, they can. You just need to figure it out from their perspective. And that's what I've spent my life doing, and I don't resent it. And this book and all the, the other two books that are coming out of it and the, the training that's coming out of it, it's a byproduct of walking life together, figuring out each other's, the, how to help each other, how to encourage someone, how to look at a divorce situation. All the different things, Bram, that we've looked at in lives, guys going to prison, mm-hmm. and that turning around to becoming an amazing testimony of God. It's all about saying to yourself in the mirror when you wake up, I can make a difference today. And it's not about the Tony Robbins, uh, I got to listen to 500 hours of Tony Robbins. Just listen to the spirit that God's put in you. And I guarantee you what he's going to say is you can make a difference. Society today needs people that believe they're part of the answer. And there's and there'll be a million people will tell you that you're not. But the only one that really matters is is Jesus and those fathers in your life, because they're always gonna tell you, go mm-hmm. make a difference. Yeah. Man. Um go back to uh uh tell me the story about how uh um I think it was you and Bill 
um, you and Bill Likens showed up. Thank you. Um, you and Bill Likens showed up on, uh, on uh, I think it was, you guys went to NAB Coronado. Oh, yeah. You guys out at the O course, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. you guys were filming something. Uh, yeah, so so the the way that I ended up, I was a pastor, a successful pastor at the time, but I was invited to the SEAL compound uh, or the BUDS compound where the entire, all three teams were going to do a 10, 10 mile run, 10 mile swim, and then the O course. And uh, Bill Likens, he was a producer from my church, and he said, Hey, would you like to go? And I'm like, I don't know, what do they do there? You know, uh, what's a seal? Um, and he says, Well, they're, it, it, you know, they swim a lot and they do things, spidey stuff. And I'm going, Well, I may be able to get a sermon illustration from it, you know? And, um, so I show up, and 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 the interesting thing is, every we we all get into a truck, you know, and you guys were on the grinder, and then you took off on the run, and and then and you're, the crew's filming, driving the truck back and forth. I'm in the truck with a team guy, and they keep calling me Pastor Greg, you know, and mm -hmm. the team guy is kind of like, you know, it's become your nickname. I actually was trying to not do that today. Oh. But I think I've called you Pastor Greg like five times today already, maybe ten, and introduced you as such. It's just, it's, and I, I don't really like it. You know? I, I know. I, 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 you've I told really me like that it. before, but I, I can't shake it. Because you, know? you know why? Because people, when you put a title in front of a person's name, they have a preconceived notion of what that sure. person is. One hundred percent. And I'm just not typical pastor. I mean, I'm just you ne definitely never aren't. Been. <laughs> so anyway, agree. we're in, we're driving, and we're in that truck, and and. Uh, and we stop, and the team guy says, "All right, everybody, get out of the truck." And you know, and, and everybody got out of the truck. Well, I was mesmerized by something. I was looking at the. I was looking at something I never saw before. I never saw the kind of resilience, or the the, the kind of representation of manhood, or the willingness to suffer. All the things I saw, I was mesmerized by. It. And and all of a sudden, I hear this: "Hey, stupid." Get out of the truck. How, what part of getting out of the truck did you not hear? <laughs> and I and I turned around and I looked at him and he walked away and I thought, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> really, I did. I thought I I love being talked to like that because you know in the Christian community there's no brutal communication, right. and brutal communication is the honest, gruff, gritty communication. That makes you shake off the dust. Hey, champ. Hey, superhero. <laughs> super star. Hey, super faith. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> hey, hero. You know, it's kind of like, it's not real. I mean, right. hey, stupid, get out of the truck. I'm like, awesome. And, and, I, and I must say that that day, God really, really touched me and said, this is your mission. And I'm like, and, and I'm like Really? This is my mission, yeah. And that's when it started. Yeah, that brutal communication. It, it can be taken too far. <laughs> it, Absolutely. It, it can, but, like, but... But I hear what you're saying, and you are 100% right. It's like, it's... it's uh, We... And I say we. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about team guys or military guys. It's just that's... It's, they... It is built into their vernacular. This is how they communicate. But even when I talk to my my kids, um, and I have these these uh, four amazing kids, yeah. that range from thirteen to twenty one, and when I when I talk to them, just the way that we play and goof around, it's it's very it's very masculine the way that we the way that we do that, and 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 I mean you know my kids, I'm, but you know for everybody that doesn't know my family structure i have three boys and a, and a and a girl and my 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 18 year old daughter is she's uh she's special needs so there's a completely different style of communication that that's with her but even she likes to rough house and play with her brothers and stuff and it's 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 adorable watching oh it is that. yeah it's so awesome but with the with the boys you know it's it's i remember when they were when they were young doing things with my boys that you would never see dads doing with their kids today. Like the way yeah. that I taught them how to swim, you know, I'm like, hold on. You trust me. Yep. Hold on to my shoulders. Get on my back. Hold on to my shoulders. Get a big breath of air. We're going to go underwater. They're 
one and a half years old, two. And I'm just swimming underwater, and they're just holding on, knowing that I'm going to come back up again. Yeah. And I and it's it. I had parents kind of looking at me like, "Why are you going to do that with your kid? You you drown your kid?" Like, no, no. Kids until they're two, two and a half years old have this have this ability to know when water is nearby, and they're going to stop breathing. You know, you just have to don't do it for a long period of time. But just the way that you communicate with them, the things you do with them, the 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 stuff that happens in and amongst a, a dad and son relationship is adjusting so much right now. Oh, the way is. that we talk, the things that are allowed to be said, the things that happen, um, the things that you, you write now, you better not text it. You better not email it. Unless you are comfortable with it being on the front lines of the New York Times, the headlines of the New York Times, because it could very well end up there. Everything you send, everything you say, true. you have to be very careful of that, which now guys are starting to meter what they say. They're starting to temper what they say. They're starting to, oh, I, that's a little harsh. I really, I really can't, I can't say that. But there are times with my kids where I'm just like, Hey, knucklehead, come here. Uh uh-uh. uh. No, no, no. And they're like, oh, got it. But before the, the, the cameras and the mic- microphones came on, we were talking about um, the affirmation piece. Yeah. And how affirmation has somehow just left our, yeah. left our society. Yeah. Um, so, so the, yep. so I'm writing a book now called, this is shameless plug, by the way, called the, uh, the law of affirmation. Yep, it's it, and it'll be out Thursday. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's thirty three <laughs> chapters. I'm I'm about three in. But the point is, it's I can't something wait to that see how he rats me out in this book. Yeah, this well, I'm not. I'm not actually. It's gonna. I'm, I've got thirty three chapters. I'm gonna talk about the history of affirmation. I'm gonna talk about examples. I'm gonna have fifty examples of affirmation. I'm going to talk about self-affirmation and the dangers of that. I'm going to talk about talk about that one for a minute now. So self-affirmation. So yep. you know, one of the things that we need to realize is that affirmation was knitted into creation. Mm-hmm. So it it was knitted, and then DNA of a man or a woman or a child longs for affirmation. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not suggesting that we have some panacea life where. We don't. We we're always affirming each other, saying stuff that isn't real. I'm talking when I talk about affirmation. I'm going to describe it as real affirmation. It's not a, this a panacea. So that's a medication for your pancreas, Zach. If you're ever wondering what that is, <laughs> uh, makes you pee funny colors and you know, tie dye shirts. Yeah, you, your urine looks like that. Ahead, <laughs> that's panacea. right. Well, the the thing about it is, is that we live in a society that is everything but. Um, um, Affirming. Um, in fact, it, it, the, our society is adept at de-affirming. That's 100%. Almost everything that is on the news, almost everything that you see, mm. everything that you hear in the media, and the way that we communicate with each other is de-affirming. Um, and so what it does, it tears down. Um, and tearing down is... To so call my kid a knucklehead? No, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> affirmation. So this is the problem. We don't understand what real affirmation is. Mm-hmm. So where do we find it first? Well, the first words of affirmation are in the creation, where God said, this is good. Mm. He created a man, and he said, this is good. And then he, he affirmed his purpose, told him what he was supposed to he do. He didn't say, this is toxic? Yeah, that's right. He did not. And then, and then when you read the Bible, you cannot not be affirmed. You, can avoid, you cannot avoid being affirmed. You cannot read Proverbs. You cannot see what Jesus did when he walked the earth. You cannot see what the disciples wrote, what Paul wrote in the epistles. You cannot read the book of Revelations without seeing that you are an important figure, that no matter where your lot in life is, whether you're a homeless person or you're in you know, some sort of a great position, Affirmation is a need, and the people that are that are if you want to if you want to really know why we have such a mental health problem today, and we have such a homeless problem today, it's these people have completely lost any mm-hmm. concept of affirmation. They've given up on it and become a mental uh, mentally ill because of a lack of affirmation. Mm. 
because what's there to affirm? And since they have no affirmation, they become what what no affirmation makes them. Yeah. And yeah, I was gonna I've got to lob this in there because I, I think it was John Eldridge wrote a book. Um, you have what it takes is mm-hmm. what is what it's called, which is a very affirming statement in itself. But it was the title of the book, and uh, Brian Tucker, my business partner out here, uh, gave me the book and said, "Hey, man, you should." You should check this out. It kind of changed the way I, I, some of the things that I communicate uh, with my, with my kids, and the book gets into talking about the gender roles in the home, which I don't know why this book hasn't been canceled yet. It probably is. It probably is. If not, it's 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 going to. So all you cancel culture people out there, go ahead and go get it. Try it. Go read the book. Knock first. yourself out. Yeah, cancel it, but make sure you read the book. You'll it'll change the way you think of of things, and the the. Uh, uh, the book, it gets when it gets into gender roles. Gender roles, it starts saying that same sex parent is is uh, responsible for developing the confidence, and the opposite sex parent is self esteem. And so, as a dad of primarily boys, right, and and they're all different. I parent them all completely different. And that's another thing that's another whole complete topic. Is it that, is, yeah. A lot of cookie cutter parenting. But you know, my but but Sam, I cannot parent him. He's nineteen. I cannot parent him. When they were like six, seven, eight in there somewhere, they were completely different. Now they're starting to kind of align and they're best friends. And so watching these guys kind of go through life together is great, being so polar opposites in the way they respond to things. But being able to sit down with each of them, spend time with each of them, and and speak life into them, because the power of life and death rests in the tongue, and being able to to talk with them about the situations they're going through, but then tell them, hey, you have what it takes, and I believe in you, and watching them as 8, 10-year-olds, 12, 15, 20, watch them all of a sudden, they start sitting up straighter. Yep. They start doing this they start leaning in on the conversation and it's so fun to see them respond that way because it's like blowing a little bit of oxygen across the spark and watch it flicker up and watching something that was maybe already a bonfire turn into this big huge roaring fire and of course if it doesn't get fed again you see it starting to kind of come down again but watching the boy's reaction after I read that book it was amazing watching the way that they respond to that telling them that i love them a lot of men don't say that no anymore and that's the no. the other issue here is that you know we we pick the words that we say and we pick them based on maybe our own pride position or we pick them based on where we we are standing um because of maybe how we were raised or our relationship with my father or an authority or the way i was hurt and abused cast aside rejected walked on stepped on and and uh and and just dis- disregarded if that happens as you're growing up as you're becoming a man and and that now it's it's you become so detached from a healthy male relationship that being able to have a healthy male relationship, especially one where he goes, dude, I love you. And then the response, you ever text that somebody and then they send back to like, same to you or back at you or, or, uh, um, or much love. That's my, one of my favorites, much love. It's like, no, no, dude, no, no, I, I, I love you. That's, 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 that, that's it. That's- you know, it, it's uncomfortable sometimes. Mm-hmm. I find when I have a lot of, I have a lot of men that say to me, you know, I love you. Uh, and most recently, this legendary Delta Force guy that uh, I was able to help save his life. Hearing him say, "I love you, man," and sometimes it's it's like it 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 hits you, and you're kind of like, "I don't want to say this, but I I love you too, man." I mean, we walk through hell together, mm-hmm. and and uh, but I've adopted that term. My kids never see my grandkids. I have seventeen grandkids, two great grandkids. They never ever are in my presence that I have not told them I love them and told them I was proud of them. And what and 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 I know that that needs to be explained, but there's something 
uh, there's, I think we're all afraid, a little bit afraid of the whole concept of love. Yeah, and well, we and it's an overused term. It's it's it is. it's an it's an overused term. Oh man, I love that stuff. Or that stuff's, I man, it, I I love that uh, that. So you, it, it's easy to attach it to a inanimate. It's a lot harder to attach it to a relationship, especially a real one. So when I talk to my wife on the phone, we have this phrase that we say we hang up. It's love you by. And I've been trying to slow down saying it because I think it's just an abuse of that word. Because although I do mean it, it's just become a word at this point. It's become a it's become a uh, an exit salutation. Right. It's become it's something where it's it's OK, we're getting off the phone. And the other night, well, we were sitting down, we were talking, and I began to visit that with her. And I, I, I told her, I just said, I, um, I want you to know how I really feel about you. You are, you are my best friend. You are the best friend I've ever had. You, the way that you treat me and the way you show respect to me, because that's how I, that's how I feel love. And you automatically, inherently know that I'm an acts of service person. And you respond according to the things that I that you know that I will respond to, and you stay in that lane, even if it's something that you just don't want to do. If you want to, you know, it's it's, it's, it's sometimes I come home, I just don't feel like making dinner. I'm usually the one that makes dinner. Sometimes I'm just sitting on the couch. I'm on my computer, and she comes in and she drops right in and just starts doing it, and then brings me a plate of food. There is no better feeling on earth than when than when she does that. And so for me to not affirm that in her. Or recognize that I'm uh, in a in a way I'm 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 telling her I'm communicating something to her that it really doesn't mean that much, but by me mentioning it to her, watching her when I say that stuff and I'm looking her in the eye, and I'm and I'm I'm holding on to her or I'm touching her and I'm saying hey when you did that, man you have no idea what that does to me inside and when you begin to express that now you're not just saying I love you, but you're saying I love you beyond just the the, words, the yeah. common use of the word. And I'm showing her, but to get back to what you said earlier that Zach has heard me say probably a thousand times now, that uh, you communicate in three ways, word, gesture, and spirit. And then when I'm affirming her and being able to do that with all three of those, it's, it's, it's remarkable the change in a relationship that can happen through the affirmation of proper communication, proper use of words, and be and 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 trying to avoid the cursory things that you just say in a relationship, but 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 finding something that is it's equal, that's unique, and putting everything you have into it and sending it downrange to the intended target, my wife, and letting her know under no circumstances am I ever going to not love her. And the response that comes off of that is incredible. So the affirmation thing. So we were just sitting in my office, and you brought the affirmation thing up, and it just it leapt inside of me, and I had to. Yeah, you know, the, the um, affirmation, I know that we've used that word a lot, but um, I'm really enjoying digging into it. Um, and uh, the... The, the thing that it's it the thing that's important for men to understand or for people to understand regarding this issue is that um, is is that you desire affirmation and you are probably right now in a position where you're like a desert there's no there's none there mm-hmm. you can flip that switch immediately and uh, it, you know you talked about love and, and affirming your wife. I've, I, I had a time in my 45 year marriage where I just didn't feel love at all for my wife. And, um, and I was noting how many things she did that, that didn't affirm me. And I, I was, I reciprocated by not affirming her. And it, 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 it we started going down different roads and, I was I was mad at her one day, and I was like, "This this is not going to work." And I said, uh, "You know, ask the Lord. It's what what's what's going on here?" And He said, "Well, you get you're getting what you sowed into. You're getting exactly nothing. 
because af- aff- affirming another person is sowing into them. And the Lord said these words to me. He said, love her like I love the church and gave myself for it and see what happens. Complete restoration of all my love for her within weeks. And her, she changed because I changed. Mm. What I'm trying to say is that when you adopt a mindset of affirming others, if you run into a guy that's angry and you de-escalate it mm-hmm. by seeing something, say, hey, man, you know, hey, you, 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 you need somebody to talk to? You realize what you just did there? You've got an angry guy. He's viscerally angry. He's mad at the world. He's mad at you. He's trying to get, and you're like, calm voice. You de-escalate through affirmation. Mm-hmm. And you're saying, well, why would I affirm that guy? He's trying. He's mad at me. He's doing this. He's doing that. Just see what happens the minute. You, you want to talk? I'm here for you, man. I'm not mad at you. That's de-affirmation. Uh, that is de-escalating a situation because that guy's only angry because of the lack of what he needs mm. in his life. The other thing I wanted to mention, Bram, is is uh, self affirmation um, is mm-hmm. is a is a is dangerous. Um, now I'm not saying it's wrong to look in the you know go work out and look in your muscles and see things or whatever. I'm not saying all uh, self affirmation is negative, but the the whole concept of addiction to pornography is a byproduct of self-affirmation you yep. you're not getting it from your wife you're not getting it from other places because you're you're you've decided to get it for yourself and as a result you've become a you've become de- desensitized to everything else some people say well how do i get off this addiction to porn well you need to first off realize that you're self you're self-affirming which is destroying every other thing in your life when you cut that out and you start affirming your wife and your kids and others and you start uh, learning to see the good in life and not the bad and not follow the society, the, the inept society, not follow their example, it is, it's a life changer. It's mm-hmm. a complete life changer. And you're not – see, the way that God intended us to be affirmed is that we sow what we – and we reap. Mm-hmm. So we sow affirmation. And what happens? We are affirmed. Yeah. Right now, the guys that are watching are saying, "I haven't felt, I haven't felt that, and I, I don't remember ever feeling it." Well, I tell you what, just just start giving it. Mm-hmm. Find ways to see the good in others. Mm-hmm. You know, don't sit 100%. there. I mean, sitting there talking about the left and the right and the this and the that. What does it end up doing? Yep. It polarizes. It doesn't help anything. Yep. You don't become an answer identifying the things that are wrong. You Come become on. an answer mm. being an answer to what is wrong. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's, a, there's, there's multimillionaires that have radio shows that all they do all day long is tear down. All day long on both sides. You know, and we have a Congress that right now, so it's divided in half. Why? Because none of them want to affirm the other. Our government, our society is right now polluted, and I'm trusting God for a movement of men that will rise up and say, I'm going to start saying the things that God would want me to say Mm. in any given situation, and I am not playing into the hands of those who want to destroy democracy, want to destroy this this country. I'm not going to do it. So you know, there's, there's there's a couple senators that are watching this right now. Wow, and uh, there's a uh, 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 a handful of congressmen that are watching this right now. So if you were to to talk to them, right, and uh, and and I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get some text messages from this. I know. Um, what would you say to them? What advice would you give to them as being people who are at the? They're I mean they're politically, and they're they're on point. They're they're doing what they've been elected to do. They're but you said something really interesting when you just said, you know, it's this, this polarizing and uh, the, 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 the polarizing aspects of the things that we're experiencing in politics or at the hands of the pundits or those offering their opinions, right? But if we were to do that and, and take those guys out of it because opinions, 
opinions are where your emotions live and they start coming out yeah. all over everything. Yeah. And it's just, it's, and then there's facts, right? Facts can change, but then there's truth. Truth, truth, truth lives, man. Truth, truth, truth will reign. It truth is when you come from a position of truth in your communication. And when you soak your affirmation in the truths that are there, it's, it's it's amazing. What would you say to the politicians? I got off on a, went down a rabbit hole. Rabbit hole. Right? See what I did there? Yeah. That's an inside joke for everybody that's watching. Um, if if you were to talk to the, the the guys watching that are in politics, what would you say to them? You know, I would say this. Nobody's going to change. Nobody wants to change what you believe about your politi- about the world. Hmm. Nobody really needs you're 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 right where you need to be, with exception to something. And I'll, I'll probably use this as an example. I was I worked on a set of a very uh, popular TV show for several years. Can we there say were, what the TV show is? No, no. Okay. So, so and there were there were probably eighty people a day on that set, and I worked on the set. Was over, it Survivor? No, it wasn't. Was it the Amazing Race? I told you I'm not going to say. Big Brother. Naked and afraid. Naked and afraid. No, it wasn't. Yes. No. <laughs> but. <laughs> But, you know, the, the thing about it is I worked on this set and there was probably 90% of the people working on this set were from, were, were um, extreme liberals. Extreme liberals. I mean, beyond anything I'd ever seen in my life. Hmm. And, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, independent, so, you know, I, I kind of, I notice all this stuff going on. But, you know, after two years, I had, I had very close friendships with 90% of those people. Mm-hmm. And I mean very close relationships with who completely who go against everything I believe. Mm-hmm. The key is is that if I, if I'm in if I'm in Congress or if I'm in a Senate chamber and I'm sitting there, the the one thing all of us at that every one of us has in uh, common, we all have issues. Everybody has issues, mm-hmm. no matter what they believe, no matter where their political bent is. If you if you address your fellow congressmen or senators with a desire to see them as a human first, with an issue with issues that you might be able to help them with, to approach them not with your teeth nod, but rather to look into their soul and say, "I want to be your friend," you're going to make a difference, mm-hmm. and it's going to bypass all the political. Um, baloney that's going on and it's going to change and that person may be somebody that's going to trust you and i think that uh, i think that's lacking in our political structure um there's a lot of boneheads there's a lot of people that are just uh wanting my way or the highway but that's not how a nation works Mm -hmm. that's not how democracy works it's not my way or the highway we have to work together to find a way. And the way is not to make politics first, to make the person first. Yes. Wow. Wow. Dr. Greg Work, W A R K, and Ray Rodriguez, um, the warfighter soul. Um, what do you think? Want to hang out and do, uh, do a few more episodes? Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to keep you. I think we have a lot more to talk to. Yeah, let's get talk some about. Water. Yeah, right on. Hey, until then, Bram Radio. Bram Radio.